Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Some numbers, mostly from the census. 50.5 million. That's the number of Hispanics living in the United States in 2010. 15.2 million. That's the increase in the Hispanic population from 2000 to 2010. 56 percent is the percent of the total population growth of the United States that Latinos made up. 64 percent. That's the proportion of Hispanics who voted Democratic in 2010. And finally, 69 percent. That's the proportion of Hispanics who were no-shows at the polls in 2010. To discuss these numbers and their impact, and much more about Hispanics in the United States and in New York, is Angelo Falcone. Angelo is president and founder of the National Institute for Latino Policy, which began in the early 1980s as a nonprofit and nonpartisan policy center focusing on Latino issues and continues to this day. Angelo combines academic and policy research with an aggressive advocacy style based on broad coalition building and community organizing. We know him by his caustic sense of humor and his progressive politics. Welcome, Angelo. It's always a treat to be with uh, you. It's nice to be here. Let's start with the 2010 census. I, I, I threw out some numbers. 50.5 million Hispanics, about one-sixth of the American population. Huge growth, 15 million people. What does that mean? in terms of the life of the nation, the life of the city, and the life of these folks? Well, well first of all, I, I question the number from, from the point of view that a lot of people don't realize that it doesn't include Puerto Rico. People assume that when they see the line, uh, you know, Puerto Ricans, that it includes the people from Puerto Rico, but it doesn't. And the reason I, I make that point is that although Puerto Rico is not a state, it's a territory, kind of a little bit like D.C. is kind of a territory, uh, everybody in Puerto Rico is basically a U.S. citizen. So my, I always raise questions, why don't you include those four million? But so if they say 50 million, they found 50 million Latinos, I say there were really 54 million because I include Puerto Rico uh, and because I think uh, it's, 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 it's an important point to make when you talk about Hispanics. A lot of people don't realize that they're not included. I mean, no, I, in fact, that before talking to you, I hadn't realized that at all. And in fact, as a New Yorker, they were the they were the first Latinos. They were the first Hispanics in the city. Certainly, that sure. that I met, and most people came into contact with, at least if not directly through West Side Story. So that really, let's just talk a little bit about the census and the sure. definitions. First of all, Latino, Hispanic. I mean, what do they mean? These these. People in Latin America don't use those terms. It's an American term. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's a way of uh, generalizing about this population. Uh, you know, since the Census Bureau started asking questions in the 70s about, you know, whether you're Hispanic or not, Spanish-speaking or not, they've used different terms. Uh, over time, they've come up with these kind of umbrella terms just as a convenience uh, to kind of generalize about this population, but it includes people from over 21 countries, uh, and it doesn't include, interestingly enough, some groups because they're not uh, Spanish-speaking. For example, Brazilians right. are not included, uh, or the Portuguese are not included as Hispanic. And they include Spaniards from Spain. Right, exactly. So it's 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 kind of like a lot of people have some questions about, you know, how uh, who's determining who's Hispanic and who's not. The term Hispanic, uh, term Latino, <clears throat> are basically American terms. They're, they're creations of uh, this country. Uh, some people say it's, uh, you know, it was government imposed. Other people say it's, it's other sources. But it's something that's uh, taken a life of its own in terms of that identity. Uh, most surveys uh, that are done on Latinos that ask you, are you Hispanic, uh, do you prefer to be called Hispanic, Latino, or what, find that people mostly who are quote-unquote Hispanic 
uh, identified primarily by the national origin. I'm yep. Puerto Rican, I'm yep. Guatemalan, whatever. That's what we found with the Hispanic Federation. But then there's this, 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 this secondary kind of identification as a Hispanic, which uh, is beginning to take uh, on some real steam. Uh, it, for example, the uh, main promoters of something like this are, like as they say, Hispanic media, who would like to have a more homogenized kind mm -hmm. of market. Uh, you find corporations using the term. But you also begin to see uh, more and more uh, organizations, whether they're Puerto Rican or Guatemalan, you begin to use the term Hispanic and Latino. Uh, and so it's, been, it's an interesting process that's going on in terms of creating this relatively new identity, uh, because these are not terms that are used in Latin America and the right. Caribbean, uh, but it's an American term. And what you're finding is, uh, generationally, when you look at those surveys, uh, you find that younger generations increasingly use that term mm. Hispanic and Latino. So there, there's, there's that kind of uh, movement going on. And then there's also the calls for Latino unity. Right now, for example, we're going throughout the country through a redistricting process. Right. And so one of the things that's becoming clear is that it doesn't really make sense within that kind of process to be t talking about uh, just Dominicans or just uh, Mexican Americans, or but rather talking about um, Latinos as a as a t as a group, uh, bringing them all together to maximize their numbers. Because as you know, with redistricting, it's all about numbers. It's all about trying to maximize uh, the number of voters from different communities. So we're finding there the nature of that redistricting process kind of begins to force uh, Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and Colombians to talk about uh, uh, being one community. Okay, let's 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 go down a level, if you will, though. But this 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 conflicts among and between these groups because they're often competing for economic resources, political resources, educational resources. So, in a sense, the, the, the larger question is: Is there is there such a thing as a Latino community? Can what, and what's the nature of the relationship between Mexicans and Mexican organizations and Ecuadorian and Ecuadorian organizations? What is it like on the ground? I know it must vary. So talk about what you know best. Well, it's, it's, you have to look at it from different angles. One is uh, from the level of the community itself of people who are not necessarily organizers, not necessarily leaders. Uh, there you have uh, much less communication, I find, between different uh, Latino communities in, the, say, New York City than what you would imagine. You don't really see uh, Guatemalans and Puerto Ricans communicating as much uh, as you'd, you'd see. However, one of the things that is not captured by the census numbers is that there is increased um, uh, intermarriage between Latino groups as well. But we don't really have a good way of gauging uh, the extent of that because the census question just doesn't deal with that. Uh, the census, for example, they ask you if you're Hispanic or not Hispanic. If you say you're Hispanic, then they tell you they have the three categories, Mexican, Puerto Rican, uh, and Cuban. Then they say, if you're not one of these groups, sign oh, right, right on something. Uh, and then on the race question, though, they ask you, are you, w you know, what's your race? Check as many as you want. They don't do that with the Hispanic question. So we really don't get a sense of how many Mexicans and Puerto sure. Ricans and Cubans have, have kind of married. So there's something going on, I think, with younger folks, because one of the things you hear more and more is uh, when you talk to a younger Latino Hispanic, very few are purely... Uh, one from one national origin. You see here, oh, I'm Puerto Rican and my mother, you know, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and Dominican. I'm Mexican and Cuban. You begin to hear that more and more and more so that there's something going on that really reinforces uh, that, that notion that there is a growing Hispanic, Latino, or pan-ethnic consciousness. And, and, and this pan-ethnic consciousness might, will likely have political implications? Oh, it, it does. I mean, right now, uh, when you talk to Latino leaders, uh, you find, in fact, there's more of a kind of a Hispanic Latino consciousness on their part. For example, Puerto Rican politicians, right, uh, their, their constituencies have changed a lot, right, so that you have a lot of important areas that were primarily Puerto Rican, you have a lot of Dominicans. Yep. So you find that political leaders themselves have to respond to that, that mixing and have then an interest in creating kind of a, a pan-ethnic kind of consciousness. So you find that you find uh, corporations trying to homogenize the, the market mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, newspapers, uh, you find the political parties also trying to do that as well. So you have all of these forces basically trying to create this, this Hispanic Latino consciousness because it makes it easier to organize, to get access to this community, uh, the language. You try to basically create some sort of universal Hisp Spanish language. Is, is, is there an organizational superstructure that can network all this? Because you can, have, you can have these changes on the ground, if you will, but if you don't have the organizations... Well, what you have is, for example, you have 
uh, the uh, uh, Spanish language media. Univis your people have heard of Univision, mm -hmm. eh, Telemundo, and all that. That's a major force in, 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 in kind of creating this Hispanic kind of consciousness. Uh, however, one of the things that people don't understand is that Telemundo and Univision are not owned by Latinos. They're owned by non-Latinos. You know, uh, Telemundo, to recent, you know, uh, now belongs to uh, Comcast. Used to be GE, uh, Univision, NBC, uh, and, and no, Univision actually has uh, private, uh, you know, uh, uh, owners, you know, uh, stockholders that are not, la for the most part, Latino. So, uh, but that's a major force. Uh, I think uh, the corporations, and as they do their marketing. Uh, is also a major force in trying to basically develop messages that uh, uh, get to the most uh, Hispanics that they can. So, so there are these kind of external forces from the community that have an interest in creating a, a Hispanic uh, kind of identity. Okay, let me, let me get to one of my gripes. Uh, Latinos dissatisfied with uh, Obama have formed the core of a new political party, which they've named the Tequila Party. Now, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not Hispanic, but it would seem to me that defining a party on an alcoholic drink is not sending the appropriate message, if you will. Well, I, you know, what's happening is that, uh, particularly around the issue of immigration reform, uh, there's been a tremendous dissatisfaction with the Obama administration because he promised that he would take this issue on, and then when he had a Democratic Congress, he didn't do it. <clears throat> he focused on on um, you know uh, the whole health insurance issue reform, uh, and so that that left a really a bad taste in the in the mouths of a lot of Latino leaders. <clears throat> so it's been uh, since since uh, he got into office uh, and hasn't delivered. There's been a lot of talk in the Latino community about the need to do something about it, uh, and that perhaps people shouldn't vote for Obama next time around, or they should just shouldn't turn out to vote. Period. Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this is the uh, tequila uh, party thing comes up, uh, coming out of Nevada, a group right. in Nevada, uh, that talked about it. And the idea was to have a, uh, it was wordplay off of the tea party, tequila party. Right. Um, and it was... It doesn't have quite the same no, historical no, resonance. No, and it was, it was kind of uh, funny because it started get, getting picked up as a symbol of that dissatisfaction. Uh, and it wasn't clear that it was really going to turn into an actual party. Uh, so it was kind of, it became like a shorthand for, uh, we're dissatisfied with the administration. We're also dissatisfied with the Republicans. Uh, and so what happened now is that a couple of folks, uh, because the thing marketed really well, I mean, because the newspapers, everybody was covering it. It's all over. Decided to let's, let's run with it. And in fact, just, just had a, uh, a rally and they basically have now created something called the Tequila Party that's going to focus on uh, voter registration in the Latino community. The problem is, you know, to, like I, I told a reporter the other day, I told him it sounds like, you know, Tequila Party sounds like a bunch of drunks getting involved in politics. I, I don't get it. You know, a lot of people who are not um, Mexican are saying, well, wait a minute, right. that, that's not much of a reference. Not that I, people would want to be a reference. I, I, you know, calling it the rum party wouldn't, wouldn't help very much. But, uh, but it's the kind of thing where um, it's kind of, you know, taking hold in people's imaginations as a general idea. Okay. But, but it it's really based on dissatisfaction yeah, with Obama, yeah, failure yeah, to pass yeah, the DREAM yeah. Act. Everything, but but the and fact also the increased uh, deportation, incarceration. Well, yeah, that's that's a big part of it. Uh, and what's happening with, for example, Ob we can't even get Obama to deal with uh, the the Dream Act and uh, base such a basic issue of uh, uh, which people feel uh, deals with basic social justice and right. just being kind of fair to people. So what what's happening is that uh, you have this this uh, tequila party thing going on, but then you do have other networks. You have. Uh, uh, we're part of a group called the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, which is a, right. a kind of a coalition of like you know like 30 of the largest Latino national organizations. Uh, there are other kind of umbrella organizations as well, um, and you know there are groups like the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed yep. Officials. Yep. So there are these umbrella groups, and they do use terms like Hispanic and Latino, mm -hmm. uh, and and they try to bring together as many of these groups as possible. Uh, the only problem is is that uh, you know I find that the, the, we have a perception problem in the Latino community. Every 10 years, the Census Bureau comes out with these numbers, and it generates all these articles about the Hispanic community, the size of the community, the economic power of the community, the, well, wait, the, power. the Latino wave. I mean, it, written it's by all, Latinos. All I mean, it, and, and you know, since the in the 1980s, you, you may remember, remember that was supposed to be so-called the decade of the Hispanic. Yep. And we keep, you know, doing that. But what's interesting is that uh, we get all this publicity, uh, and when this, these numbers come out, 
in the Latino community, people feel, well, wow, wow, we're really coming of age. Uh, we really have some clout here. Uh, and then outside the Latino community, there are a lot of elements that really are terrified by these numbers. You know, they basically the reaction is, uh, holy shit, what's going happening to the country? Uh, and so, especially in economic uh, uh, times like we have now, uh, it's opposed to a positive thing. It's seen as, as a negative thing. Uh, and then that's something we have to deal with as well. Uh, at the same time, uh, because we get all this publicity, it sounds like Latinos are doing a lot better than we really are, that we have much more political power and economic power than we really do, because a lot of our organizations, like, quite frankly, even some of our national organizations, very under have been over the years undercapitalized, mm -hmm. are relatively small, are not keeping up with the scale of the size of the community. So you have this tremendous increase in the population, and the organizations stay small. Mm -hmm. and, and we see this when we look at advocacy in Washington, for example. We'll find that many of the uh, white advocacy organizations on different things are very large, have multi-million dollar budgets, and some of the largest Latino organizations have barely uh, that kind of, you know, don't have that kind of, uh, you know, budget at all, despite the size of the community. But even though you've got, you know, demographics ultimately is destiny, but right, as I noted in one of the early statistics opening this show, 69% of Hispanics were no shows at the polls in 2010. So you've got a, a group for a variety of reasons, some, some citizenship reasons, some age and de demography reasons, but other, other non-sort of, you know, deterministic reasons why they don't vote. They don't register and they don't vote. So... Well, part of the problem, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, the citizenship uh, thing is a big issue in terms of knocking off people who are just not eligible because they're not citizens. Mm. The age issue is another one. This is a younger population, so there are people uh, yep. not eligible. Then you add the issue of um, you know the problem we have in this country, and that is that uh, voting participation is very tied to social economic status. So you have a, a communities that have very high poverty rates, mm -hmm. uh, low income, and so you put all that stuff together, it makes sense that you would have lower rates of participation. At the same time, as we're seeing with the reaction to Obama, uh, you're also beginning to see a tremendous amount of cynicism about the political process. Mm -hmm. And this also has an effect uh, when you're getting constantly bashed as a, you know, with all this anti-immigrant talk, uh, there are people who really do not consider Hispanics to be human beings. They, they see us as, uh, I don't know what. Uh, and so all that stuff, you put that together, it makes sense. The question is, uh, there was a time when the community was able to take those kinds of reactions. And, and, and then grow and, from and, them. And grow from them and organize around right. that. And that's, uh, that's what you're seeing uh, happening. Uh, and I'm not sure if we have solutions to this thing, uh, because the problem is that the scale, the size of the community, like I said, is overwhelming the size of the infrastructure right. of the community in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of support we need for being able to do advocacy work, vote organizing work. Uh, there just aren't the resources there. For example, in, in comparison to the black community, uh, which has similar problems, uh, one of the things that's been very different is that, for example, uh, we find or, uh, black organizations over the years have had a, a significant white support. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, many uh, important black organizations uh, were partially uh, founded by, by whites. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a sense that the black experience was an American experience. Mm -hmm. In the Latino case, we don't have that connection. We, we're constantly trying to make the case uh, that, you know, we need support from Americans in general. Uh, we're constantly, many of the organizations, when they do their reports or whatever, emphasize the fact that Latino problems are American problems. Um, and it hasn't really worked because, you know, there's this counter narrative, and that is that we're foreigners. We all just got here. Uh, we're drained on American society. And in fact, we don't even want to speak English. Uh, we want to even challenge the culture. So there's this thing of the other, right? And we really occupy that space. Uh, and that's created a, a lot of obstacles to this community in terms of re getting resources, kind of a broader community, uh, you know, uh, support from the public. Uh, and those are real, real challenges. Okay. Let's move more micro, sort of the state of the Latino politics in New York City. I remember, you know, there, there, there was a heyday almost of Latino politics. You know, you met mayoral candidates, unsuccessful, ultimately, from Herman Badillo through Freddie Ferrer, et cetera. What's, th there doesn't seem to be that, that leadership out there, the political notables that we once knew. Yeah, well, it's, it's again, New York City uh, with 2.3 million Latinos, uh, Puerto Ricans used to be 
eighty percent of the Latino population. Now we're about thirty-one percent. It's unbelievable. The Over the last fifteen years, it's shrunk so dramatically. It's, it's shrunk, but it also it's it's gotten smaller. But you know, one of the things we like to point out is, again, we're talking about two point three million Latinos. Uh, Puerto Ricans make up about seven hundred twenty-three thousand people. Uh, still a very large number, but when you talk about it comparatively, it makes it sound like we're disappearing. But we're still the largest uh, group of Latinos are Puerto Ricans. And also, for example, there are now more Puerto Ricans than Italians. Than, and they have been German. since the 90s. Yeah, oh, yeah, a lot of people won't realize that. Oh, so it's yeah. still, still a very, very oh, large sure. part of the uh, population. And, but you, so you have this uh, you know, uh, really, really diverse Latino population because it's followed by Dominicans. Uh, then there are Mexicans, Ecuadorians, Colombians. It's a really a wide range of, 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 of groups in, in New York City. The, po the politicians, the elected officials, there were about maybe 27, 28, around that. Uh, f uh, all but four are Puerto Rican, four or five. Uh, the four or five are Dominican. Right. And so you're seeing uh, growth. I think the Dominican population has been growing, uh, is, 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 is getting better, rep more representation. Uh, and but what's happening is that this leadership is really uh, seen in a, in a very negative light in the Latino community because it's not, there's a lot of corruption, the, you know, investigations, uh, you some of them are in jail. Sure. You know, it's, it's really uh, the kind of thing where uh, there's a lead, real leadership gap and uh, crisis in the Latino community uh, despite the size, despite the talent we have. Uh, it, it's what's happened is that in the Latino community, for a variety of historical reasons, um, we've become so dependent uh, for uh, uh, our advocacy on elected officials. Uh, when you look at, I always make the comparison with the African American community. You look at African American politics, you're talking about not only elected officials, you're talking about uh, strong kind of church oh, leadership. Oh, absolutely. You're talking about even uh, stronger uh, business leadership, yep. civic. So you have a wide variety of leaders, which you don't have in the Latino community. Uh, Why? Well, one reason, for example, uh, for the majority of Latinos, despite all the news you hear about uh, Reverend Diaz on same-sex marriage. Well, the majority of Puerto Ricans are, I mean, Latinos, not just Puerto Ricans, but uh, Latinos are Catholics. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church has been so distant uh, from the Latino community in terms of providing any kind of leadership um, that it's, it's uh, I call it a kind of colonial relationship. It's like a colonial church. Don't start me. <laughs> so what happens is that uh, the church has never embraced in any serious way, I don't think, the Latino community in terms of having us uh, any serious representation within the hierarchy, in terms of taking on our issues. Uh, that hasn't happened. Um, and so w that's a major uh, problem. Business development, for example, in terms of business leaders, uh, has been always been weak in New York compared to, for example, uh, Miami, Los Angeles. Uh, so that that has never really gotten off the ground in terms of a, a, a serious, uh, uh, you know, kind of entrepreneurial class in that regard. Uh, at, at the again at the scale that that we need uh, at the university level, there's always been a struggle to you know with Latino studies and trying to get also this kind of intellectual class off the ground. I mean, it was just a report a few years ago that the number of Puerto Rican faculty in CUNY was declining. Yep. Uh, so you know you take all this stuff together and you see very different history. Uh, public sector employment, for example, very important in the African American sure. community in terms of creating at least a lower middle class. And not only them, the, the, the Irish. Historic, the historically. Them, right. And so what happens, for example, is uh, Latinos continue to be one of the most underrepresented groups in terms of city and, and, and at state. Uh, for example, at the state level, uh, Latinos are r roughly about 4% of the state state work uh, workforce, uh, while making up about 15 percent of the mm -hmm. population, uh, African Americans, for example, are about I guess 17 uh, percent, even though there are less African Americans, for example, than Latinos. Yep. Uh, so what happens is not to say that African Americans doing that well in terms of you know managerial sure. positions, but but, relative it, but, to but but all it does is it basically talks about the impact of kind of historical forces. That is the impact of the civil rights movement in terms of opening a public sector employment and the lack of a real Latino uh, civil rights movement in, in that direction right. that did, never played that role. So as, as some people observed, uh, the, the system's response to, to black demands was public sector employment, mm -hmm. while the main uh, response to Puerto Ricans, for example, who were the, the kind of the pioneers in raising these issues sure. in New York, was welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you take that, that history, you take those kind of developments together, and so it makes sense 
when you look at what's happening today. Uh, the thing was, uh, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, there was a strong kind of nationalist movement in these communities. In the, in the Puerto Rican case, you had the Young Lords. Sure. Uh, you had people like, uh, like you mentioned, Herman Badillo. You had uh, certain political leaders that were emerging as insurgents. Right. Uh, and were challenging the system. Uh, what happened was, over time, is that the system kind of absorbed these forces. Uh, and so you, what you wind up today is with a very weak leadership in that regard, uh, kind of very fragmented. Uh, the, the, the political parties uh, have successfully integrated but marginalized the elected officials. Mm -hmm. So you have a group of uh, Latino elected officials that are really very marginalized. It's a group that, if it worked together, uh, could have tremendous clout in places like Albany. Right. Uh, but, simply, but they don't. No, because they've been basically co-opted. They've been basically uh, allow, you know, allowed a certain uh, degree of entrance. But, for example, what's the common complaint? Well, you don't see Latinos uh, being put up for citywide, statewide office. Uh, not, not an issue. Uh, whenever a new governor comes in, whether it was Spitzer, David Patterson, or, you know, the current governor, oh, we can't get a meeting with him. He won't be, meet with us. He won't really address our issues. And you wonder, well, wait a minute, These are, this is a group of, uh, you know, Latino elected officials up in the Senate uh, and in the Assembly. Why can't they get access to, to, to these players? Uh, and why can't they do more, have more, why don't they have more clout? And what's happening with the Democratic Party in terms of this community that has not, has been successfully able to avoid having to deal with this community and give it uh, its, its fair share in terms of political power. Uh, we don't have a strategy as a community to deal with uh, putting pressure on the Democratic Party. Uh, we don't know exactly what to do with these elected officials we have because some of them are good, but a lot of them are, you know, non-entities or they're very strange. You know, uh, Ruben Diaz uh, Sr., for example, is, is always a very funny kind of guy. He shows up to interviews on Spanish stations with cowboy hats and, you know, people don't know what to make of this guy. Okay, bottom line, five seconds, the future? Well, I think the future is one where we're beginning to see a new generation of folks coming up uh, who are very unhappy with what's going on, that are trying to seek ways of organizing in different ways. We're finding um, that, uh, for example, on the issue of immigration has, has really gotten a lot of new uh, actors involved in the Latino community. Uh, we have Puerto Ricans who are very sensitive to the immigration issue, a little counterintuitive. You're going to have to talk about these folks next time, next time because they're telling me goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. My thanks to you, Angelo Falcone. You're welcome back. We have to continue this conversation. Sure. It's too short. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.